Hello, friends, and welcome. You are listening to Art Blog Radio, recorded right here in Philadelphia. My name is Natalie Sandstrom, and today you are joining us for episode two of Art Blog Radio's mini series on cultural accessibility. Today, we are going to explore policy and bring in some disability history to help us unpack the context for cultural access today. Today, I'm recording from my home in West Philadelphia on the traditional territory of the Lenny Lenape people, past, present, and future. Again, my name's Natalie. I use she, her pronouns. Today, I am wearing a black long sleeve shirt. I have brown hair. I'm a white woman. I'm sitting in front of sort of a light gray wall, and you can see the bottom half of a framed painting behind me. Joining me today for episode two is Professor Kate Fielkowski. Kate is the Director of Academic Programs for the Institute on Disabilities at the College of Education and Human Development at Temple University. She was born in Philly and is a lifelong disability advocate with interests in disability identity and disability narratives. She also teaches disability studies at Temple and has actually been a wonderful professor of mine in that program. So I'm super, super excited to talk with her today and share with you all of the amazing things that she has taught me. So today we're going to be thinking about that relationship of policy to access equity and kind of thinking about how we got here. So hi, Kate, and welcome. Thanks for being here today. Hey, Natalie. Thank you so much. That was a nice uh, introduction. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> well, you make it so easy, you know? <laughs> So yeah, let me just introduce myself and sort of set this little Zoom window in which I'm operating. As Natalie said, my name is Kate Fielkowski. I use uh, she, her pronouns. I am a pink freckled woman with strawberry blonde hair. Very messy. I got the whole boho vibe going on today since my house humidity is like 90%. And behind me in the frame are some disability artifacts, a number of disability books, in particular first-person narratives. And just the edge of the picture above my head is a photograph of myself, and I'm going to tilt my screen up, myself and my brother David. Um, And I want to say uh, for the people who are listening, I am also a person with a strong disability identity that is both familial as well as personal. And so for me, this is not just professional. And thanks so much for inviting me, Natalie. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for adding on to that introduction. I, you know, definitely want to give you space if you'd like to talk more about that at any point. I'll just open it up. So I think Just to kind of get us started, you know, this is episode two, we're building upon the conversation that I had with Katie Sampson of ArtReach in episode one, which really thought about accessibility right now. We thought a lot about the impact of COVID on arts programming and just kind of these dialogues of access in the fields. And so I think I'm hoping that our conversation today can really take that as a jumping off point and think maybe about what's some of the history that got us to this point and what's still to be done, what other what other entry points are there. So I'm going to throw out that very general question and we can kind of just play with it from there. Thanks. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say what is a starting point, right? Mm-hmm. And I do want to say that one of the things that's really important is to recognize and appreciate that our conversation here today is a conversation that that has started way back in time. And this is just like a like a page in a book of a series of conversations that have been happening. So in terms of the arts, I think where I'd like to start is Alan Lomax. So I'm going to start in a place that's not history, but that it is the arts and culture. So Alan Lomax, and I'm not an arts expert, but I was really fascinated by the work of Alan Lomax because Alan Lomax was a curator of folk music. And so Alan Lomax back in the 1930s actually like went around America and tried to capture the music of different populations. 
because there was sort of the music that everybody was hearing that's um, like we would say pop culture, right? So there is common cultural music, but that cultural artifacts communities have their own their own music, their own voice, the way that they express themselves in rhythm and instruments and song and the words of the song. And so Alan Lomax really did an entire ethnographic research process collecting these cultural artifacts to diversify the world of music. And so, so I wanna say like we should start with that idea of cultural accessibility and history with a point where we're starting from the idea of cultural equity. So are we doing the work, right? Are we doing the work like Alan Lomax did to go out and actively pull in these resources, collect these resources and to make these voices known? So when we think about the the curatorial process, when we think about disability and art, I'm going to mention another resource. Wolf Wolfensberger talked about in the art that we see on the walls in museums, what is the role of characters in the art, this characterization of disability in the arts, right? And he termed this deviancy juxtaposition, which is like so meaningful. Like if you look at the characterization, so in the curatorial process, when we are trying to curate art, what is the role uh, or what is the appearance of people with disabilities in, in the art? And it's always in this deviancy juxtaposition. So for example, um, a little person will be positioned next to a dog or small children. Right. So everything is about where the character is and what does that mean about the character? So I'm just kind of meandering around this idea, but I think that it's important for us to start with. And I what are we curating and what does it mean that we curate and what does it mean that we have this entire um, field of images of a deviancy juxtaposition of people with disabilities? Right. So anyway, I, I want to also pause to give you a chance to jump in, too. <laughs> I think that's such a great place to start, particularly because there are so many examples that we can think of, not only in visual art, but kind of across media. I mean, I think the first thing that came to mind in thinking about deviancy juxtaposition for me was old, old, old religious art. And you're seeing images of people being magically healed, right, of, of some malady. And there is sort of this early cure-focused approach that we see in the arts that, you know, kind of sets up this thinking of the medical model of disability, which, you know, you and I have talked a lot about in class, of course, right. but, you know, for those who may not know, when we're thinking about models of disability, models of anything, that's sort of a way of framing something. And so the medical model is this diagnostic, cure-focused model of thinking about what is wrong with a person, what needs to be fixed with somebody. And it's kind of reductive, right? It, it puts the, the issue of disability on an individual rather than thinking about an alternative model, which is something like a the societal model, the social model of disability that says society is inaccessible, is the issue. And we as a community, local, global, whatever, need to take responsibility and make the world better for everyone to be in. And I think if we're thinking about these conversations of equity and inclusion, which are two words we hear together a lot these days or see together a lot or find in any kind of medium. These are two things that often go hand in hand, you know, and, and we find this outside of visual art as well. I mean, I'm thinking about performing arts in right. which there are characters, you know, like the trope of the blind prophet, right? right? And 
how many other ways and how many other spaces are we coming across these really problematic representations that are not from within the community in question. Right, exactly. And turning the individual into a spectacle, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, the part of the question about art is, well, what is the purpose of art? And there's a long history that is an economic purpose of art, right? So there's the speculative aspect. We want to make an investment. There should be a big return on investment. You know, let's collect an elite, you know, create a, an elite collection. And so, you know, the, the interesting aspects that will draw a crowd become part of the spectacle. And so there's a long history of curating work where disability is part of the spectacle from an economic aspect, right? Side show. The side show, right? Right. There's that whole history. So I think that, you know, that's one aspect is the curatorial aspect. What are we collecting? Why are we collecting? What purpose does it serve? And how is disability representation in that? What, what, what do we see when we look at people with disabilities in, in the arts? The second thing that I would say is then the history, a history of artists with disabilities. So not just the curatorial process, but now artists with disabilities and what role do they play? And from an equity perspective, we have the huge field of the outsider artists, right? The people who are not following the tradition. So I wanna mention one artist in particular whom I am totally infatuated with their work. The artist's name is Judith Scott. And so Judith Scott is a tactile artist that did work based in found objects. And so they would, find objects and then ensconce in tomb, wrap them in elaborate textiles and would make for small wrapped objects that could be maybe handheld and enormous objects as well. And the, the art is really remarkable, but it's always contextualized as outsider art, Judith Scott as a person with disabilities. And then I think because of the economic aspect and part of that spectacle of disability, like let's kind of set this up and tell people the backstory. So I don't know, I, I think that they're kind of tied together. What role do we allow artists with disabilities to play? And, and how often do we kind of move them over into the outsider space, which I think sort of creates that spectacle, you know, maintains that spectacle role. I don't know what you think. Are you familiar with Judith? I don't, I don't know if we've ever talked about Judith Scott before. I am. Yeah. I don't think we've talked about her work in class, but one of the other artists who always comes to mind when I see her work is Yayoi Kusama, who of course is having such a big moment and texturally, spatially, even I see a lot of similarities in their work, but of course that's never a connection I've seen made. I think because we have these different almost spheres of influence between a mainstream or blue chip artist right. versus a right. person who's been positioned as an outsider artist. And I think that language is so telling outsider, right? We're outsider, still, right. we're still using this word right. as a whole category. You know, it's like when we think about folk art or craft or whatever, these are all also ways of categorizing right. that sort of have these effects of othering or right. creating these hierarchies. And are, diminishing, right. 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 That are reinforced through terminology and I'm not sure what purpose in a contemporary setting these still serve other than just being able to say like this gallery is over here, this gallery is over here, right? In some kind right. of encyclopedic museum. Right. But I think language just comes up as a big part of this relationship of the work, whether it's visual art, performing arts, whatever, to the interpretation. Right. I think that that's a you know, what you said, like, what's the purpose of the language anymore? So when we 
think about the work that we have to do to make something, um, you know, more equitable, cultural equity, and we look at cultural equity in our institutions, you know, I think a large part of the work that we have to do is to really examine those kinds of things. Um, what roles are we allowing this population to play? And what language are we using to describe that work? Um, obviously, one of the other dimensions is uh, how, how do we, how permeable, I'll use that word, how permeable are the walls of the art institution? So, you know, by, by design, art has always been about exalting self-aggrandizement of kings, right? Um, elite collections. And so historically, the big institutions of art were in those same kind of buildings, right? Like capital buildings, large steps on the top of a hill, like the Parthenon, right? Um, and so when we talk about cultural equity, we're really talking about permeable borders and boundaries. And are we letting people in or are we maintaining elitism? And I think that there's a big difference between um, categorization of collections, you know, the curatorial process. So categorization, which we still have to be careful with, as we said, mm -hmm. or are we really using that as an implicit method of elitism of you know, restricting who is allowed in the space and and what role can they play? Mm. Um, yeah, I you think know. That's a so, great point. I think a lot of what we talk about is access is about who do we allow in, and we think about that in a, in a physical space. But part of the question is, but what role do we allow them to play? Are they in the curated works? Are they the artists that we do curate? Is this population part of the staff? Is this population part of our funders? Um, and it certainly is this population a population that can, can enter the building and are welcomed in the building. But mm -hmm. I would say that all those preceding things are factors of being welcomed. You know, they're all right. part of the welcoming and the equity. Yeah, just those sort of key points of representation. Are you going to go right. into a space that you don't feel, that you feel you're alone in? in, in right. many ways. So I think some of right. those points that you've made about who's on staff, what needs to change, et cetera, those are definitely some things that are going to come up in episode three of this series, which is kind of the, the wish list episode for the future. Um, so we're doing some great foreshadowing there, but I actually wanted to go back for one second um, to another point you made, which was you said something on, along the lines of, you know, these buildings on a big hill with tons of steps leading up. And even that is something that up until recently hasn't necessarily been physically accessible. I mean, we talk right. about mostly so far, we've had this conversation about sort of what's on the walls in a building, who's on stage, et cetera. But from a visitor perspective, there are these architectural barriers as well that really go back to as recent of a history as the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, that it wasn't until then that these buildings needed to have a ramp so that people could traverse those big, huge stairs. I mean, even someplace like the PMA, right? We've got our local example of big old stairs, very, very uh, culturally recognizable big old stairs. It is, here. and it's the epitome <laughs> of that, you know, yeah. on the hill, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just sort of some of these points that we can weave together of there's all these layers of what access equity representation means from both an inside physical spatial way, as well as an outside, if you're thinking about those permeable boundaries, which I love as a, as a phrase. So anyway. Just wanted yeah, to hit I mean, on that. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned the ADA and I mean, gosh, like 1990s is a long time ago, if you think about it. Um, but the Americans with Disabilities Act 
and the passage of the Americans, you know, so all of this is like my point of view, right? So the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act was really an economic act. Um, so a large portion of what is codified is about the ability of people um, with disabilities to be employed. So it decreases barriers to entry to employment. And so the ADA fundamentally in the United States, which is different than the law in the rest of the world, is the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UN Convention. Our act is really an economic, has an economic focus. So, um, you know, so it still plays that role. Like we still fundamentally in the United States have an entrenched idea of who is allowed where. And when we open up doors, we're typically trying to open them up so that there's an economic rationale to that, right? There's an economic rationale to opening the doors. Um, one of the, the economic rationale is if we have special programming, we can sometimes get funding for special programming, right? But that's not an equity perspective, that's an economic perspective. And that's why we need different voices to participate in the conversation. So if we have all the same people historically that were in an institution, how can you have all the same people having a new conversation? You need some new people in as well to sort of stimulate the new conversation. So anyway, you know, you think about these grand elite institutions um, where the architecture is, has meaning. You know, the, the place, the space, the location, you know, the geography on the hill has meaning. You would think we could do a better job of incorporating accessible architecture into the building instead of finding an entrance in the back in the, you know, the rear delivery parking lot where we can put in an elevator. And so people who are using alternative um, mobility devices have to come in through the entrance where, you know, bulk supplies come in and out. So again, you know, what is the impression that you get when you, you don't get the experience that ta-da, I mean, it's meant to be overwhelming. It's meant to be like looking at the face of God. Right. Sublime. Story. Yeah. It's supposed to be the sublime. You are supposed to be awestruck by this experience and you really don't get that awestruck experience crawling around in the alleyway, you know, three paces to the left of the trash can coming in the back elevator and then winding your way down the dark hallway. Um, so I don't know. I just think that um, we're sitting here so far removed from the introduction of the ADA and so many amendments and, and changes to it. And you'd think we could we could start you know, being creative about our design and that that would be part of the, you know, the artistic process, the, the conception of space, right? Mm. Yeah. I think for me, that really begs the question of what more is there to be done, whether in a policy realm or elsewhere, you know, is policy more policy, more, you know, legal, um, enforcement or new laws or whatever, is that the way to kind of continue to make change, make improvements? Or are there other methods that should be explored more fully? Like how do these ecosystems kind of work together to continue, right? If, if we're going to look back in another 30 years, how do we forge on down this path? Right. Well, um, so personally, um, I spent a lot of time on the policy side and where I am today is I feel that policy is always about a minimum standard mm -hmm. um, because it always follows a litigious route. And so there's something about it inherently that, that like falls to a minimum standard. And the problem with that is I think that when people feel that they've made the effort to make the minimum standard, they're good, they're done. You know, <laughs> check that off the list. And um, when we think about cultural equity, 
and, and frame it in that way, we acknowledge that we are never done. So I think that the first thing that we have to do as, um, you know, all institutions, academic, arts, whatever, is that there has to be a, a great reframing of this from access to cultural equity. Are, are we allowing voices in and do those voices because of their participation, do we give them the power to change things? So if your role is you're only allowed to come to the museum on free Tuesday night, your voice will never be a voice of change for that institution, right? Um, if you are always coming just for a specific programming, then you're not really changing things. Everything stays the same except for that one exceptional night. Um, so I think reframing, when we reframe to cultural equity um, instead of accessibility, that is not a policy statement now, it can be an institutional policy statement, but not a legal policy statement from the from the government. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, I think yeah. that differentiation between. National policy, state policy, local policy, and then an individual organizational policy is super important to make, I think, particularly when we're talking about the arts, you know, you see a lot of museums, theaters, um, whatever, publishers, I guess, that have their mission statement on their website. And in a way, we can kind of think of those as a policy statement, right? Whether or not we're using that right. same language, the purpose is that declaration of purpose that we see at the start of a piece of policy. And so I think those levels are kind of an interesting way to think about change on various scales, platforms, timelines moving right. forward. Right. Excellent. Wow. So much, so much good stuff in here. I'm just <laughs> learning so many new things all the time. It's great. <laughs> so I would really kind of like to wrap up by thinking a little bit more about our current moment, right? We were recording this at the end of June in 2021. Over the past year, we've seen so many different kinds of changes take place, whether they are social, political movements, as well as, of course, coming out of a pandemic. And if we're thinking about, in particular, cultural equity, you know, what can we as individuals, as organizations, as a society, learn and leverage from some of the experiences that we've all had collectively or individually. Because of course, you know, some of these have been very community specific moments. So, so what is a takeaway or a few takeaways that maybe we can all continue to ruminate on moving forward, in your opinion? Yeah, you know, I really feel like as much as things change, they stay the same. And so the questions, I just feel like the questions are the same. So during this year, we made a tremendous shift moving from in-person and face-to-face -to, -face to this, you know, to <laughs> Zoom and alternative media and using that for communications. But the questions still remain the same because it is not true that the internet is ubiquitous, that, that it is ubiquitously available, right? It is not considered a utility. Mm -hmm. And so it is not made available in that way. And so we still have so many people who are left out. So I want to go back to, um, I want to end maybe where we started. Alan Lomax went into the Appalachia area, right? I mean, we still have to go out. And my concern is, and a lot of people are happy about the technology 
and there's some great things about it, but but sometimes they just become more excuses for us not doing the hard stuff. And in order to really have cultural equity, we have to go out and, and do the hard work. And we have to go and meet people where they are. And we have to, you know, go and spend the time and sit with people and get them engaged. And in that process, um, there isn't a process of going to those people and telling them something. You're learning, they're learning, you know, it, it's a mutual learning experience. And so we have to go in that way. That, that there's an exchange, a cultural exchange that's happening. So I guess I would say that in this moment, I see this big shift to a technology where we still have so many people who are left out, people who can't see the screen, people who can't read the information in the transcripts and, and people who use alternative ways of expressing themselves. So how, how are we going out and, and really soliciting the greater community in our processes. So anyway, I'm sort of left with a bunch of questions instead of a bunch of answers from this year. I think that's sort of ideal, right? The questions are the things that, you know, keep challenging everybody to do better. So if we're left with a pile of questions, that kind of sounds like a great outcome to me. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again so, so much for your time, for sharing all of these brilliant thoughts and names and resources, all of which will be made available on the post page for this episode on Art Blog's website. I'm going to wrap it up here. Just again, thank you to all of our audience members, our listeners, our viewers for tuning in to this episode on Art Blog Radio. Thank you, Kate, for joining me and everyone. I hope you make sure to tune back in for episode three, where we will consider the future and think about what more we can do to better this work. Maybe some of those questions that Kate has posed will continue to percolate for us. So thank you again and uh, thank see you. you back here soon. Appreciate you, Natalie. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks.